Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 16. I find television very educating. Every time someone turns on the set, I go into the other room and read a book. Groucho Marx. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my screenwriters, to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Now, this is since it's going to be our last of the Sundance edition episodes, though there might be a couple little guys I toss around, maybe as little bonus episodes um, moving forward, but this is the last official one for the Sundance uh, series. Uh, it was a really interesting conversation with a young man by the name of Matthew Doyle. He is a TV lit agent over at Verve Talent and Lit Agency. And, you know, it was really interesting. I wanted to get a real insider's look at the television uh, market, you know, for writers, specifically how to get your pilots made, get them in, how to submit them, what the industry is looking for, what the, you know, what the streaming networks are looking for, what network television is looking for, what you should do. Should you make a pilot? Should you not make a pilot? And Matthew's a young guy. He's coming up. He's literally basically at the beginning of his career, but he's a very, you know, he's a rising star in the industry. And I really wanted to get kind of like an in the trenches look at, uh, at the television literary market right now and see what, what it takes to, to make it. Do you need a pilot? Do you not need a pilot? Uh, what are this? What are they looking for? What are the, what's the industry looking for? What are streaming uh, platforms looking for? What is the te- network television looking for? And Matthew is one of those guys that really is in the trenches right now and gave us really valuable information about what the industry is looking for right now. And also another big shout out to Adam Bowman from Media Circus PR. Adam was uh, that beautiful place that you see on our YouTube channel. That is Adam's place, and he also handled all the audio for these. Uh, these productions. So Adam, thank you so much. If you guys are looking for a publicist for your film and want to get a little bit more recognition, want to get interviews, want to get a little bit of hype going around your movie, these guys work specifically and exclusively with independent filmmakers. So they definitely understand us. (laughs) So I'll leave their information in the show notes as well. So without any further ado, here is our conversation with Matthew Doyle. Hi, I'm Alex Ferrari. And I'm Sebastian Tordaz. And we are here with uh, Matthew Doyle, who is an agent at Verve. Thank you, Matthew, for uh, for doing this. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, yeah. I heard uh, through the trades that you just had a really great promotion. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so the way it works at Verve and pretty much any agency is they don't tell you when you're going to get promoted. Right. Which is uh, torture. It is torturous. <laughs> it is day, torturous. It's like, it's like being on death row. Like, you don't know if you're going to... But in a positive way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's brutal. And um, you're stewing. And myself, I felt in my mind that I deserve to get promoted, which has nothing to do with whether you will get promoted. Kind of uh, like life in the film business. Yeah. So, yeah, there's no... <laughs> it's not fair at all. Um, and But I was hoping to, and we had the holiday party uh, for the company. And if there was one last chance to get promoted, it would have been at the holiday party. And I knew this, Mm -hmm. they had this video that they showed of all the agent's parents sort of talking about how, when they knew their child was going to be, uh, an agent. (laughs) They did, did that. They know you were going to be an agent. That's an awesome. I, I, I <laughs> we knew Matthew that, would be an agent as soon as he was born. <laughs> they, well, they showed all these all the agents' That's parents, awesome. and they're really old, and it's great. Yeah. And awesome. then um, the video ends, and then it starts up again, and my parents are on the screen, and yeah, they, you were at the end. Like uh, yeah. they tortured you 
all the way to like cool. after well, the I was, credits. I actually was it by that point. I was having. I was. So other people got promoted before you. You were the last. No, no. I was. No. The, I was the only one promoted to agent. Okay. So, I, the 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 thing was happening, and I was watching it, and it was poignant, whatever. And um, then my parents come up, and um, they start talking about my childhood, and it's really kind of weird and <laughs> awkward. Awkward. <laughs> I thought, and it was emotional. And then they said that Matt, you're an agent. So it's something that the partners had spoken to them about weeks beforehand, and they kept it kept it quiet for me. Yeah, and kept time. it quiet. Wow! And they agented them. They agented my parents because my parents did a video, and then they called them back, and they were like, "This is great. We love it. Perfect. We need to do is maybe like make it a little bit shorter, right?" <laughs> That's great notes. <laughs> yeah. So they gave really good notes, and my parents were like, "Wow, they're the nicest individuals." And it's like you were you were being you were agented. agented. Yeah. That's, <laughs> It's kind of how it works. So explain what agent being agent is again. It's just basically notes and like that whole convincing someone to do something without um, making without them realizing that they're being convinced to do it or offending them. And that's an art. Yeah, it's being. But yeah, yeah, it is. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. Okay. Very cool. Okay, so what kind of agent are you now? I'm a literary agent for television. I represent writers and directors uh, in the television business. Excellent. Right. Now, when I, I mean, I mean, we talk a lot about indie filmmakers, and I know there's a lot of indie filmmakers now that are trying to go into television, trying yeah. to do series. And do you think it's smart to do a kind of spec, uh, you know, spec episode of of a, of a show, like as a proof of concept or something like that, or is it better to just create a bible? Or what would be the process? What would you suggest? Well, yeah, actually, if you have the finances to create a spec episode of the show, I think that is really smart. Okay. Um, I, there are several examples of that that have. That have Keep, worked out. An example would Let's be the first example would be a show that's aired on TBS, Search Party. Okay. The way that happened is now the talent involved was more substantial than probably m- where most people are starting out. Sure. But the way that happened is they made that for on spec a short pilot for like maybe ten thousand dollars, and they used that as a proof of concept for a series. Okay. And then it was off of that, they were able to take it to TBS and say, this is how it's supposed to look. This is the style of it. And that gave the executives a better understanding. Of, Boy, I want to drill down this. Is this people yeah. who have already succeeded in the business? They, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember who the writer, director, or the creator was. There were people who were already established enough. But the point is, and if they hadn't done that, it would never would have been bought. It was only when they made it that they were able to get people interested. Isn't Sunny, uh, it's always Sunny in Philadelphia. Did they, That's another example. They did right. that too, is right? Yeah. Did That's that. another example. Right. I remember that. I remember that story hitting because it was done very low budget. Who was, did they have the stars there yet or no? But yeah, it was all, I mean, there weren't stars then. Rob McElhaney. But DeVito De wasn't with them at that point. No, he came in like the second or the third season. Okay. Because the network wanted to add some star power to it. Got but it. originally it was just Charlie Day, Rob McElhaney, uh, Caitlin Olsen, um, right, so they weren't star- They weren't stars yet. No, not at all. They made it using cheap the too. Proof of concept, and it was really and they were lucky because right. they brought it to a net to FX right at a time when they were Hungry. open and willing to uh, engage in something like that. It's re- it's it would be surprising if a place like HBO, for example, were to mm-hmm. purchase something like that. But TBS, when it purchased the Search Party, right. and I'm outside, I had nothing to do with that. This is sure, just sure. through what you hear through the grapevine and sure. the stories you remember, but they are in the process of trying to rebrand themselves. So when TBS, the fact that TBS is trying to rebrand themselves makes it perfect for them to take a risk on something like search party and be like, okay, we see you're trying to do something different mm-hmm. and we want something different. So we'll purchase But then it. here's the real question. Are yeah. you actually watching produced spec pilots? I would hundred percent watch produced spec pilot. I would probably, watch a produced spec pilot before you read one before I, I read, I would be more excited to watch it. Yeah. Because that they're putting their money where their mouth is and the roll in the dice. Yeah. It's an, it's indicating uh, their ability to execute their vision. Mm-hmm. And if they can't do it, then it'll be apparent from, but that's, the that's the question that I worry about. Like sometimes you might be better on the page than if you actually produced it, if you didn't have the resources that, somebody like you might be used to seeing. 
Yeah, you're, you're right. They, it depends on who's doing it. If you're a writer director and you have that ability, um, then, I mean, the, the fact is, if you want to be a talent, you should be self aware enough to know how to realize it, whether you need to bring in an, a director or whether you need to bring in a talent and not act in it yourself. So right. if you can't execute it on your own, then that's, your, that's just a learning experience. Now, as a package, like let's say I go out and shoot a spec spot, a spec yeah, pilot. Yeah. What else? Should they have a Bible? Should they have a seri- the first season written? What else should they bring? Uh, as a general rule, having the most you possibly can. Well, it used, the way it used to be is in broadcast television, it's a pitch-driven business. Mm-hmm. You would go in and you would talk about an idea and it would be 30 to 40 minutes, even an hour, like bloodline. Mm-hmm. For which sold to Netflix mm-hmm. was like a two hour pitch when that sold and it was epic and it was detailed recently t- television has become as in like the fat f- past five six years television has become a spec driven business as in people actually write the show and then they take it to the networks right but a, a spec script pilot exactly now mm-hmm. the, the reason it didn't used to be that way is because if an artist executes a script and you take it to the network and if they buy it, what else is there for them to do? The value of the network executives is in shaping the script and giving notes. So usually networks executives are not willing to engage in that. And right now the spec market is glutted for television. Everyone has a spec pilot and wants to take it out, especially from baby writers. It's not as unique and interesting as it was, but like true detective in like 2011, whenever that sold, Mm -hmm. that was a spec pilot and they had, uh, a pilot, they had a series, um, and they had the stars attached, of course. So, like that was essential packaging. So, but so so it's a gluttony right now of spec yeah. scripts right now. So, if you had a actual spec pilot shot, it pulls you above. Yeah, it separates you from it separates the crowd. You. In the same way that probably having a spec four or five years ago separated you from the crowd. It was it was something different, right? Because it was pitched before, yeah. And then it was if you had a spec, and now we've taken it. To yeah, the exactly. Next level. Now, how how I mean, obviously the streaming networks and Amazon, Netflix, and Hulu. How has that affected your job, your business? Because obviously there's so many more options and opportunities for your clients. But how has that affected the market in general that that you've seen in your experience? Well, it, uh, an important thing to say is, from my perspective, mm-hmm. I'm just starting out in my career, mm-hmm. um, so. I have my own thoughts on like the industry, but it's important to keep in mind that my position of someone who's in the trenches. That's that, I, have, I want. Yeah. I want your point okay. of view, and I want your point of view from the trenches. From the from the trenches, what it it's a place like Netflix. Mm-hmm. You sell a show to Netflix, and the first thing I think about as a representative mm-hmm. is the fact that there are, there are so many shows on there. And the marketing push, it seems, the marketing push by each, but behind each one is significantly less. So you can sell a show to Netflix and it gets lost in the crowd. It's a crowded ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And as a representative, that's scary because all you want for the artist is to add value to the network in an undeniable way, which gives you, which gives them leverage and you leverage for them to uh, use in the marketplace and get mm-hmm. them the best possible deal. Whereas with Netflix... And with Amazon, when you make a deal with them, they are very generous in their series orders, but they mm-hmm. buy out all the territories and they own it till the end of time. So <laughs> the fine. amount of money you can make is capped <clears throat> at the very, t- it's up front. Exactly. So you're not going to make the amount of money you would have made had you sold it to um, a traditional broadcast network or even like a traditional cable network. For example, right. how do you find clients? Um, we got you. Um, uh, being in the trenches, as being in it as much as I can. Okay. The which mm, means what? It mean, I, here's, I here's, here's what it means. You here's work. Mean. You work like like mad. So where do you find people that you want to represent? Um. Okay. Here's an example. All I can do is go through the examples of the people who are actually my sure, clients. Okay? Sure, yeah. So I represent a writing team, Tanner Bean and Katie Mathewson, their staff writers uh, on Pitch, mm-hmm. right, which aired on Fox. Mm-hmm. So I used to work at WME, which is a larger agency. WME represents Dan Fogelman, mm-hmm. um, who's a big name showrunner guy. 
he had reached out to WME and made them aware of his assistant, young Tanner, right. saying, this guy's great. You should check him out. I saw, and then the email was forwarded to the department and I made, I, my goal is to read everything as just read as much as I can. So I read it and no one else did. And I know no one else did because no one else reached out to him. And I read this thing and I was like, this is really good. And I met with him. I just reached out to him cold and I liked his personality. He had great relationships. He understood the business. Um, he had a writing partner and that's how I uh, got involved with him. So you think it helps to work in the business a little bit before, before, uh, without question, yeah. without question there, there, you do need to sort of, it helps to understand how it all works. Now that was, that was one example. Um, you know, another example is, uh, there's a client who Verve represents named Arkasha Stevenson, who has a film at the festival. Mm-hmm. Um, and she made a fit. She was a graduate of AFI and as an agency, we became aware of her through screenings of that. And if you're as an, as a representative, you want to have your finger on the pulse of everything. And the way to do that is to go out as much as you can to industry uh, events, to screenings, to watch anything and everything there is and establish. An so does that mean you're going to like, you know, like USC first look or to NYU screenings? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. Does exactly it, what does you it did. mean you go to a lot of film festivals, not just Sundance? Cause this is the obvious one. Mm-hmm. We're at Sundance by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah right. We never actually said that. Uh, yeah. wait, does that mean you go to other film festivals to smaller ones? I mean, are you actually yeah. doing that? That would be, yeah, that's, that's the ideal, but yeah. And also being intelligent about it and you can't do everything, but you try and do as much as you can. And, Eventually, just if you're a pinball in a machine, you're bouncing around, you're going to hit things. And it's a great analogy. Engaging, it's not that great. Analogy. It's, a, it's a really good analogy. It's a good analogy. Um, good. If, you're, if you're engaging, then you're going to establish relationships with people and you're going to understand what their ambitions are. And as an agent, all I care about is what people want to achieve in their own lives. And that's just not for artists, that's for executives mm-hmm. as well. And so, my conversation with people always comes to that. And then when you find that out, you think of ways of how you can help them. So you, uh, let me, let me just, I just want to get this right because I, I'm, I'm very cautious about people actually producing a spec pilot. Because yeah, why are you a, so against it? I'm not against it per se. Uh, I'm cautious because it's a lot of money to it do can, that. It can be. Is, is it still mostly that you are reading like, are you mostly For me, still oh, yeah, reading samples? Seeing spec pilots, I hardly... Because yeah, there's not... So it, no, it's a rare thing. Rare. It's a rare thing. Yeah, we're, I'm assuming that you happen to have the money to make it. And the talent and the infrastructure and the, and yeah, the gear exactly. and the people and the talent. Yeah. And then I'm also worried that, you know, you're... you're I'm worried about expectations because when it comes to the page, I mean, it, it it's, people are just writing or typing. That's it. They've it's got cheap. It. Right. <laughs> it's really so, cheap to do that. So it's, it's more democratic in a sense. I mean, but producing a spec pilot either takes a lot of money or you have to, to fill it with people that are names. I mean, so my, my question is, are your expectations? It depends too on, high. On, it depends on your goal mm-hmm. of, of who, of you, who you want to be. There's some writers who all they want to do is, is just right. And that's fine. And then for that purpose, it makes sense to just put it on the page right. and have it be undeniable. Mm-hmm. There are some people who want to be writers and directors. And if that's the case, then having a spec pilot is that, excellent. Right. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, for personal experience, I worked on a, a spec pilot where I did a lot of posts on it and they spent 50, 60,000, had some names in it. That's Insane. Yeah, it is, but it's not. That's what happened. But then that's, that's why no, I'm, because they did it at a very high level. Time they had they had some faces in it, but nothing, no major stars. Mm-hmm. Some TV faces, and uh, it went nowhere. And I was just like, well, and it wasn't that bad. But I was like, it just See, because went my nowhere. question is ultimately my question is, it has to work on the page. So why even go to the process of producing it if it doesn't work? There's, on the page? There, from uh, from you, my point of view, I'm 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 well, I'm on you both your sides. I'm both no, of your sides. Why want He's the agent. What do you think of that? It, it depends on what your I mean, why objective produce is. it if you if you if you nail it on the page shouldn't that be enough? But if you produce it on the film on film, it just takes that edge up to the next level. So do you believe that? If you have a well, or produ- should it just work on the page? You, you're not. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> it, it all it all needs to work. Right. Exactly. It all needs to work. If it doesn't work on the page, it's not going to work as a produced pilot. 
But if it works on a page and you produce the pilot, it will probably get more attention sure. than if it's just a script. But this is a very unique scenario. Yeah. It, that's the thing we're trying yeah. – I think that's what Sebastian is trying to say. This the idea of a every $60,000 produced pilot – that, no, that's you know, you know what I'm trying to say. I, no, there is something different. I, I, I believe it should work. I'm, I'm worried because a lot of our audience sure. are newer to the business. Right. Okay? Yeah. So, so you have to be really careful about what you're like telling them to do or not do. And and I, I sort of believe that some people they'll they'll write a script and it, for whatever reason the script's not getting traction. So then they think, oh, I'll make it. And then it'll get traction. And that's not necessarily the case. No, you're right. You're and so right. the, the, so it's all, it's about getting good advice. I mean, the right people, if you go to the point of making the script, I think, I think you should if have you write a good script. Who, yeah. It'll get traction. Let me just ask you one last question about this and then we'll move yes. on. Yes. How many spec pilots have you seen that have gone to show, to, to network when sold? It's not that many, I don't think. Has any? Spe- hold on. You're talking about something that was written, written and produced. Oh, <clears throat> that you know of, besides the two examples. That I know of. of yeah. I know there are more examples of this. There, there have right. to be. Right, but there aren't a lot. I don't think. Okay, well, think of it this way: like um, high maintenance. Mm-hmm. That was on Vimeo. Mm-hmm. That was made by a writing and directing team. Mm-hmm. Vimeo. No one went to Vimeo for watching original content. Right. And then they did for high maintenance. And then they went to HBO. Now, if you're talking about that as a spec pilot, which I would consider, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a spec like series. That's an example of that search party as well. From my understanding, it's always sunny. And that's where my knowledge of it ends. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think there are that many. There will be more. The future, I think there will be more. I think there is. It's not something that happens often yet. I don't think. Now, do you, have you ever seen? uh, It's, oh, uh, of course not. It's not the norm now. But if your goal is to stand out, that it w- it will make you stand out okay. by doing that. that now, that's all. Have you heard of any feature films that were later turned into a TV series mm-hmm. off of like an indie film? Like, hey, this is a, a great concept. We love the indie film. Let's turn it into a series. If the if the creators decided to go down that route, I know there are examples of this under the. Lights, I'm going to blank on any okay. like, truly great examples. But you would look at that. I mean, okay, so we're not considering Friday Night Lights in any film, right? I'm oh, sorry? You're not considering Friday Night Lights in any film. Mm. It's, well, it's just not, so we can't Should, No, 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 no. That's not an indie film. Because <laughs> that's the only thing that comes well, I, mean, I think, I think the, the bigger question is not to I, – I, I don't like putting on the spot for, for specific examples. But the question is yeah. would you be open to yeah. watching indie films that you without, would do something with it? That, without question. Sure. Like I mentioned earlier a client, Arkasha Stevenson mm-hmm. yes. of Verve. She's a filmmaker mm-hmm. through and through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She has a voice. And – as a graduate of AFI, she her goal is to make feature films. What she's made are short films. Those short films, we've gotten her traction in television. We sold an original idea mm-hmm. that she had simply because we were able to send the short film saying, this is who she is, this is her voice, and people want to meet with her because of that. So if there is a voice there, then on the television side, I can figure it out. I know I can. And I'm... From my so position, you, I'm a street urchin. So, but I can, I know, I, I know I can figure it out. If it's undeniable voice, right. and I don't care whether it's a drawing or a play or a, mm-hmm. a short film or a feature length film, I don't care. Can I ask um, a, a little bit about like actually selling a script? Um, like, what kind of money is involved in that? Is it usually scale or is it more? I mean, like, for it depends on the leverage writers. you have. It depends on the leverage leverage you have. In the what do you mean by uh, just the leverage you personally it means if, represent? Your, if, you, if you just take it to one buyer uh-huh. and they're oh, okay. a young writer and no other place wants to buy it, then you, you're in no position to demand high level fees. Right. Okay. So you're you're only you're going to be getting scale. Something, something of that nature. But each each situation, it's fluid and it's different. Mm-hmm. And right now, we're, we're at a time where there are so many different buyers right. that what each is offering is is really uh, is really different. Like the fact that baby writers can sell a series to Netflix, <laughs> right. and it's ordered a series off of that. That's crazy, but it's happening. And they've got the pockets to do it. And yeah. Apple might jump in to the game now too. They ha- they are in the game. Oh, really? They are in the game. They have they have upcoming series. Yeah. Oh Jesus! 
That's insane. <laughs> That'll be great. It's, it's gonna been be- announced. There's a series with Dr. Dre. Verve, Verve yeah, no, yeah, he did. Yeah. You heard about we're, that. we're all over it. But yeah, Apple's is in the game. And that's gonna be that's gonna be a heck of a, a shock in the in the marketplace. I have, I have no idea. And I, and I have a question. Yeah. Of all these series that are getting made, like we're over four hundred now, I guess. Uh, it's like four hundred and sixteen. How many of a those series, a, a year? Yeah. Currently, there are 416, 426 yes. series. <sighs> yes. And John Landgraf, the mayor of television, that's what he said. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, the mayor of television. That's very funny. Okay, uh, John Landgraf is the president of FX. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and and he, he, he actually, if you, actually, I would recommend Googling John Landgraf. Absolutely. Because he, he talks a lot about, like, the, like having uh, too many pi- too many series actually and that it might be tapering off but here's my question yeah uh, <laughs> of all these series so 400 plus series how many of those are by baby writers new writers how many of those are really by people who already have established themselves in TV do you know just in general the vast majority are from people who have already established themselves in television and and the fact is if you're a young writer and you write a series it is not the case that you're going to be the sole person in control of the series. Because when you sell it to a network, any network, you have to add other elements to it. You need to add producers, showrunners, directors. Yeah, sure. You need someone in control who knows what they're doing. Now, there are examples like um, Mr. Robot, mm-hmm. the same S mail. So he was a feature guy. He wrote um, a script that got on the blacklist in maybe like 2009. An incredibly talented writer. He, you wouldn't. You, he's not. It's not appropriate to call him baby, but he's someone who is not thoroughly broken in television. But when he wrote Mister Robot, it was just an undeniable script. The first season, you know, he was effectively. I don't. I don't actually know if, what he was the showrunner exactly. I would bet. I would bet he is, mm-hmm. just because his voice is so clear. But he was surrounded by um, several things. The director of it was. I think it was Niels Ardenopolev, but someone who is extraordinarily accomplished. He had anonymous content, probably the best television and feature production company there is out there mm-hmm. behind him. He was surrounded by people who could help him execute his vision. In the second season, he, I think this is the case, um, he wrote and directed, he directed every episode. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay. It's auteur television. Wow. Same now, and if you look at um, the girlfriend experience on Stars, yeah, yeah. same example. Now that's so Lodge Kerrigan and Amy Simons. Mm-hmm. They that was all shepherded by Steven Soderbergh. Mm-hmm. If they were just by themselves, it probably would not have happened as it did. But because they had Steven Soderbergh as the father figure, and he had done the Nick, and he's a genius, <laughs> right? And he gives no fucks. I, so he, none. from what I understand, he sold it to he brought it to. Uh, Chris Albrecht and said, this is a series we want to do. These guys are really talented. We're going to deliver you all these episodes. Here are all the scripts. And they're like, okay. Here's what I know. Okay. So most of them are established writers, which is what I thought it was. Yeah. How do you then establish a writer? Let, let's say somebody out of film school or somebody who's just come across your desk, they're a new writer. How do you establish them? What's the process of eventually normally getting them through to the point where they can sell and run a show? Like, what's that like? To be able to run a show. Uh, yeah. But don't, don't, don't go too fast. I mean, like, okay. from, well, like back, breaking back, a writer. Steps, How do you break a writer? Uh, sending their material and talking about them to anyone and everyone. That's why you need an agent. How much, how much material do they need for you to send? It can just be one. Mm-hmm. But one it, good it, one. It, yeah. <laughs> they, Usually a spec pilot, original spec pilot. Something that shows your voice. Could it be a screenplay? Yeah, without question. Could it be a play? Yeah. Absolutely. So it could be any original uh, writing? Yeah. That has your voice. Yeah. And so your job is to do what then? My job is to call people, meet people, tell them about this artist, why they're incredible, and why um, they should be in business with them. And then half the job is the writing. Is half the job also the personality of the writer? Yeah. The being in the room? Is that literally half? Not more so, yeah. If not more so. So just in the, they're, they're being good in the room. Mm-hmm. So what, that, that was my next question. What do you look for in a new client? I want, I want to, I want leaders. What um, does that mean? Well, here's an example. There was someone who is an exceptionally talented writer director, um, who I was really interested in. And I went to a screening of, uh, her work and it was a, it was a panel of women is what it was. And they were all talking about their ambitions after they showed the short film. 
at the panel itself, she, in my opinion, dominated. She was just the unquestionable leader of it. And she had the most vision. She was the most aggressive. She was the funniest and she was the smartest. And she made such a clear impression that even from all the way in the back of the theater, I could tell like this person is going places. She was just a force. Personality. Yeah. The, so the personality is a huge aspect of it. And if you're talking about representing showrunners and representing directors, you want to represent field marshals yeah. of their crafts. And that's, so that's the, that's what I look for primarily. And then okay. of course the talent. Okay. So then you're sending them out there. You're sending the scripts out for people to read. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to the meetings. Yeah. What happens? How do you get, how do you get the money? How do you get them working? Uh, as what an agent, your job is to frame it right. Set the table. It's, they start with generals. They meet with each other. They talk about their shared path. Um, pass the the hope is that when you set a general meeting and in talking about and in, when the agent and the manager prep them appropriately they can um go in knowing what the potential opportunities are at that network so you set them up with a studio or a production company and they can touch on what they are personally interested in about the production company or the studio or the network if the Production, if if you can bring it up to them saying showing you've done your research, then that's going to be a more engaging conversation. And hopefully what comes out of it is they're keeping you in mind for the opportunities that whether it's a staffing opportunity, whether it's a directing opportunity, they leave the meeting thinking that you uh, would be someone that they would want to work with. So that's really why you need to have the personality. Now, what advice do you give someone who's just trying to break in? Trying to get to Just you. trying to break in? Trying to break in, trying to get an agent. What what what's what do you suggest? What's your advice? It's all this is all gonna be really trite. I'm, I, let me try. I'm trying to think of something Work hard. to say. <laughs> yeah. Be yourself. No, no. Um, have your original voice. Yeah, having an original voice, but that don't people can think they have an original voice and they don't. <laughs> right. So that doesn't really that really doesn't really do much. Um, this is so trite. I'm sorry. Um, be work. Just work crazy hard. If you're obsessed, mm-hmm. then that I mean that that's the most important thing. But then then again, people can think they're obsessed and they're not. They can think they're working hard and they're not. So you just you have to have a realistic perspective on where you stand and how you compare and have such an appetite and in a way be so insecure about your position and if you are, it's because you realize about where you stand and the potential that you have and how far that gap is. And that's what gives you the drive to, uh, put in the work and put in the time, um, and reach that potential. Also, can we, can we ask being self-aware in a word, being self-aware? Sure. Can, can we go to the origin story? Yeah, sure. Are we okay? How did you... I, I, I want to get your origin story. Yeah. How did this you... interview started backward. Wow. <laughs> we, did on, we did it on purpose, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're kind of playing around a little bit to see, to see what works. Sometimes people like origin story first. Sometimes they like something like that pops first. I have a question. You just play around. Mm-hmm. Aren't you having Elijah Wood in this program? Mm-hmm. Yes. Are you going to do an origin story for Elijah Wood? No. No. Okay. That's because everybody knows his origin story. No. I mean, you have to tailor a little bit, too. I mean, I thought the Fair. coolest thing for you was that, I mean, you just got promoted. I mean, it's yeah. Yeah, that's why we the started end of that. 2016. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Merry Christmas. The, my promotion, I, I promise you, my promotion story is not that cool. Yeah. There are way, I respect Ver for what they did yeah. and rah, rah, rah. Yeah. But there are way cooler promotion stories. At WME, Hugh Jackman. Uh, came up on the screen and promoted uh, Patrick Weitzel's assistant to agent. Nice. Yeah, it, it, stuff like that. Like, that is cool. <laughs> Mike and Elizabeth Doyle stumbling <laughs> through lines. That's not that After cool. notes. Yeah, uh, after uh, notes. After notes. <laughs> yeah, revealing. Well, you also got into Variety. You got into, what's it called? The ne- Was it the Next Gen or what was it? Oh, yeah, it was Variety New Leaders. New Leaders. Um, yeah, there's that word again. Leader. Well, leaders. So, all right, so, so how? So, so to tease you a little so bit. So when you got in, but wait, we got to get his origin. Yeah, so like, where, yeah, yeah, origin. where are you from? Get... Literally, where are you from? Where'd you go to school? When did you know Virginia. you wanted to do this? Uh, I'm from okay. Virginia. I Virginia, grew up in Arlington, Virginia. Mm-hmm. Five minutes from DC. The 
probably the most important thing about my background is that, or the most defining thing about it was the fact that I was a twin. Oh. I really wanted to be different than him. So from a young age, I gravitated towards a career because if I knew, I knew if I could be really specific um, about that, then no one would have that on me. Entertainment was what I focused on initially. And from a pretty young age, it was um, being an agent. I didn't know what it meant. Really? So you were, when you were young, you were like, I want to be an agent. Yeah. Wow. But like you don't understand. How young. old were you when you knew that? And why? 14. Did you have a picture why? of Ari Gold on, on your wall? No, no, no. <laughs> what did you see that made you want to be an agent? That's kind of. It was an article about Richard Lovett, Brian Lord, Kevin O'Vane, David O'Connor. CAA. Yeah. CAA. There was an LA Times article um, after they assumed the mantle at CAA. Mm-hmm. And that article, and it sort of profiled them all like they were Backstreet Boys. Um, <laughs> and then there was an article about Richard Lovett. And reading about his personality, I it happened at just the right time where I was trying to find I was my problems were nothing in the scheme of things. But at the time, emotionally I was like, who am I as a person? That just happens when you're getting older and how can I be special? Uh, and how am I different? And I really respond to reading about his personality mm-hmm. and the ethos he seemed to embody. Um and so I was like, okay, I think I think I can do that. So and, for those people out there, read Powerhouse, which is the whole CA story, yeah. and then read The Agency, which is also really good if you're interested in this world. At there all. are a lot. Of, there are a lot of great books. Read The Mailroom. The Mailroom. Read. read uh, this is not about. Read um, Keys to the Kingdom by Kim Masters. Kim Masters. Yeah. Uh, I love Keys to the Kingdom. Yeah, that's great. It's not. It's not talked about. As much, um, yeah. I mean, that's that's if you want to talk about like Mike Eisner and Mike Ovitz. And well, the, Jeff the, that book it it's uh, goes into the details about three personalities: Jeffrey Katzberg, Mike Eisner, Michael Ovitz, right. and how their relationships intertwined and interlocked, and how they affected each other. And it's fascinating. And also, why the business is the way it is, because there was a specific incident. But what happened since we're here That's in the winter time? Mm-hmm. Uh, Frank G. Wells, who was a, a very important person in the business, he was like the number two really at Disney. Died when he 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 was like a like a ultimate skier. Like he would jump out of helicopters, mm-hmm. and uh, there was a helicopter accident. Yeah, oh. so he died. But when he died, that set off a chain of events that like really changed the whole structure of the business, which is yeah, which led to the founding of, of DreamWorks. Led to the founding of DreamWorks, led to the change of CA into 2.0. But anyway, yeah, we digress. There was one other, a good story. The other one book I was when I was in Florida and had no interactions with Hollywood. I read Ovitz, the book yeah, Ovitz. Oh, yeah. and that was just like my mind was blown. I was like, you know, all the whole story of how he did it and what he did. I wouldn't call that journalism, though. No, it's just a, a book that, that is that, that was propaganda. That was carefully manufactured propaganda. Yeah, but it was. Fascinating read true. <laughs> for someone who had never been in the business at yeah. that point. That's true. Well, anyway, let's. So, so you right, really yeah. liked you liked the uh, these the, the Young Turks. I did CAA. I do called them mm-hmm. and still do. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so then, what was your what? How'd you go about? So I in? I went to college in Virginia. My parents told me you need to go in state. Um, I graduated after Virginia has no connection to entertainment. I, and actually, maybe I, it, was, it was on me for not doing my research and trying to figure it out. Um, they probably, I, I know they have like some connections like Tina Fey and St. <laughs> Winston. Um, so the, I graduated after my third year and I moved out here. Now, the summer after my second year of college, I had interned in Los Angeles. Spent a very little, lonely summer um, interning at two production companies. That's where I met you at your USC class and try to get a sense of, of H&T stuff. And I, I tried to brand myself as the guy who wants to be an agent. And I sat down with Lars Theriot. Lars at ICM. Yeah. yeah. Did you keep I was up with 15 Lars? minutes late for the meeting. Oh, oh no, 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 that was, no. It, it was, it, I'm an idiot. Oh. <laughs> I'm an idiot. So, but, it, but it worked out apparently. We gotta get Lars on this show. Who knows what my path could have been? But I, so I sat down with yeah. So I sat down with agents, and I was so unpolished, even more so than I am now. And I 
was just like, I want to be an agent. This is the person I want to be. And it was kind of ridiculous. And then I came back after I was an unpaid intern, uh, when, after I graduated from school at De Bonaventura Pictures. Lorenzo de Bonaventura, who uh, produced yeah. the Transformers. He's, he's, yeah. What else? Legendary I mean, producer. So, big so, deal. So, yeah, he's a legendary producer. Fa- former president of Warner Brothers. But I, So I was an unpaid intern at his production company um, where no one made eye contact with me. Uh, that was <laughs> the nature of, of who I was. <laughs> we both laugh at this. It's so <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fun. sad. It's, it's sad, but I completely, yeah. That's... Well, I, I think I made people uncomfortable because... Well, were you like snooping through their cars or something? <laughs> well, no, I, as a guy and I, I think I was just sloppy and I was super aggressive and I was just all over you, the place. You had no finesse. No. And, I, and, for, and further, I wasn't getting paid, so they probably felt sorry for me. <laughs> I was being taken <laughs> advantage a, of. It's a combination of <laughs> You were being of taken advantage of. Were, Technically, they shouldn't have been doing it. That's not legal anymore, yeah, actually. Not anymore. But anyway. yeah, no comment. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's super but you, Did you learn something? On we go. It, well, it was it was essential. If I hadn't done that, mm-hmm. here's what the here's what happened with that. I developed relationships and I got a better understanding of how the industry worked. But the the most important thing was the relationship I developed with an assistant there. The assistant, I'm going to get to give her a shout, Sarah Ullman, mm-hmm. who was so hard on me. But even for all that, she was essential in me getting my job at the first agency I worked at WME. She submitted me to a guy who was Ari Emanuel's assistant. And Ari Emanuel is dyslexic. His assistants at times have the prerogative to send emails on his behalf. Um, to make a long story short, she sent his assistant my resume. He sent my resume to HR from Ari. And so that's why I was hired. Because they thought that Ari. Ari was recommending me. Great. Wow. So that's how I got in. So I started in the mailroom. I had no idea what I was doing. I was in the mailroom for four months. Then I worked for a feature agent, Simon Faber, uh, for seven months uh, when he covered Sundance. Then I moved um, over to television. I worked for Mark Corman in the television department. And, and then I worked for David Stone. And I was there uh, pr- four years and I was an agent trainee. Usually takes about, I'd say probably five to six years to get promoted. Is it really that long? Jeez. It used to be shorter. Yeah. It well, used to be like three or four. Time. There are people who get promoted quicker. Yeah. It, but it, it, so much of it is who you work for at the right time. Yes. It used to be that CAA, it takes like five and a half years, six years to get promoted. Um, but recently, for a lot of reasons, people get promoted a lot quicker there. Because they just had the need in ways they didn't have before. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I was there. I was trying to figure out a way to get promoted. And a I, and your hours were insane. Like, describe some of your hours because I, yeah. I think they were crazy. I worked pretty hard. I got in seven thirty, and I was there till ten thirty or eleven. How often? Almost every night. For how long? Years. Four years. Yeah. Did you ever sleep there? No, I never did that. I never slept there. That's like really hard. Were other people working at that level or just some people? Did or? you ever see anyone sleeping there? Yeah, saying. I've seen sleep, people sleep there. Huh. The, but here's the thing. Uh, water seeds to its own level. So in this business, in this day and age with technology, anyone can justify working all the time because th- – there's always things to do. Always. But, and if you're a workaholic and you need something to justify meaning in your life, you're going to do it all the time. And that's what I was doing. And additionally, I was holding on so tight because I was so scared it would go away at any moment. <laughs> the way I got in was so random that I, and I, I felt I didn't fit in. And so I felt truly that would be fired. And frankly, working for Simon Faber. I was a moron in the first three months. He, I, I thought he was tough on me. He wasn't. Um, harder bosses would have fired me. Same with Corman. Same with David Stone. All of those agents, they, looking back, they could have easily let me go. And it would have been fair. Um, so I, I worked really hard to compensate for that because I felt if, I, if I'm working all the time, they can't say to me that... <laughs> You know, you're not giving it your all. And so like, that's the, that's what I had. And that's why I held on 
to show my value. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way though. And also, I mean, it's certainly not healthy, but rather than working from seven thirty to ten thirty and then leaving, mm-hmm. you, it's way better to be more intelligent about how you spend your time. Um, however you can do that. And I probably was not nearly, I've gotten a lot smarter about how I spend my time. So while I work a lot now, it's not about being in the office. Now it's about getting out there and seeing people having breakfast, lunches, dinners, coffees, drinks every single day of the week and not defining myself by the guys in the office. You know, my, my favorite story, I just want to see if you have anything to say about this. Yeah. I'm not going to say the whole name, but it's Hyro, who's a manager now. My favorite story out of uh-huh. everybody who I've ever interviewed or talked to or met in any class, when he was a creative executive at Warner Brothers, yeah. uh, creative executive would mean that he was, he'd just been made an executive, So, yeah. but he was at kind of the low end and had a long ways to go. Anyway, um, the, what, what brought this up was you mentioning going out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He would go out for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every sing, every single day every single day and he said to us that he had not set foot in a grocery store in over a year because wow. every day of the week he did breakfast lunch and dinner with somebody and it was all paid for by Warner Brothers sure well <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you think of that that's, <laughs> that, I, that's I, that's I respect the story. hustle I respect the hustle yeah. <laughs> it's great he's now, done well I want to also ask you what made you want to be a literary agent and also a literary agent in television as yeah. opposed to well I came out of here for agents. features right uh, I knew it was a gradual process of discovering what it meant when I when I first was telling myself I wanted to be an agent I didn't know that I was divided into different departments you know I just saw Richard Lovett represents Will Smith and he represents Steven Spielberg. Okay, cool. Um, I started in the feature department because I'm really passionate about film and directors of it. It was just clear when I moved over to television that that's where the momentum in the industry was Mm -hmm. as far as financial promise and also artistic promise. Mm -hmm. So, and also secondly, I, all I cared about for being an agent was understanding the different arenas so I could advise accordingly. If you look like at an agent like Ari Emanuel, his brilliance as an agent and his brilliance in running an agency is understanding all these different businesses and how they work. He started in television lit. And then he started, then Endeavor was founded. He starts representing Mark Wahlberg. He starts representing his former roommate, Pete Berg, who was an aspiring actor, turns him into a director. And, I mean, for Mark Wahlberg, for example, he takes this actor and then he builds a business producing television, producing unscripted shows, movies, and it's incredible. That's the value of of being an agent, knowing how to grow and build someone, not just in uh, one field, but multiple fields. So that was the additional benefit of that. I I love film and I want to continue to stay involved in that. My relationships in it are not what they are in television, but mm-hmm. well, actually I wanted to just ask him real quick. Agencies are separated like an agency, like WME or CAA or UTA, ICM, they have different divisions, departments. Yeah. Can you can, can tell us like break it down? Sure. So it's motion picture lit motion picture, literary representing writers and directors for film motion picture or sorry, television lit representing writers and directors for television unscripted representing reality stars and production companies for reality television uh, and talent. And Most I don't picture talent and then TV talent. It depends. You know, at WME, they, didn't, they had agents who focused on television talent, but it wasn't clear departments. They jump back and forth sometimes. With like the blur yeah. the image. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now, especially with the more and more. Yeah. I mean, frankly, in my mind, not that anyone cares what I think, but it's all <laughs> becoming the same. Like right. if you're in a, a feature agent and you're at Sundance and like just last year, for example, Netflix and Amazon are making the most purchases. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a year before that or two years before that, later, people were just wrapping their heads around the idea of them as television distributors. It's like, well, they're not even television. No. They're a streaming, streaming platform. And they're streaming long-form co- content and short-form content. Yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all mixing. Yeah. And this year, Sundance, it's the first year that they have um, episodic television 
in, in uh, as, as part of the festival. Yes, yeah, where my client Arkasha Stevenson's film Vessels is showing, <laughs> and she's very talented. Yeah, very cool. and they're also starting. I think they're starting going to do web series relatively soon. Yeah, that form. makes sense. Yeah. Which, yeah, because it, the, the lines are blurring totally. Well, like I was like uh, we were talking last night when we went out to dinner. We're walking Main Street and we see YouTube. Yeah, and we're just like, man, things have changed. Like you know, eight yeah. years ago when I came, you know, you know it was like YouTube. What's the what? Yeah. Like, crazy. It's it's insane. You have any other questions? Um, no, I think uh, I think uh, I think I'm all right. Thank you, you, sir, so much. Thank you so much. Did you have fun? I did. <laughs> the interview. I did have fun. Awesome. Yeah, I love Elijah Wood. I'm happy to be featured oh in the series. <laughs> oh my god, be featured. We we all did, which is why we're interviewing him. But it's so aware of as well. But really, just a fan of. I'll you know, ask you one more question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Name three of your favorite films of all time. Okay. Um, this shouldn't be this hard, Matthew. Come on. It's, okay. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. A lot of people get it's hard for a lot. Of I, this is not a hard question. No. I know, but I want I, I, it needs to be impressive. No, 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 no. Don't try to don't, no. don't, just what you like. It could be something as silly as Look, right, ET right. number one. ET then Star Wars done. Yeah, yeah you're good. Yeah, I could go Toy Story, Forrest right, Gump. Right, right. Let's go. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Awesome. Really? Yeah. More than Raiders. Yeah, more than Raiders. What do you think? Don't ju- don't judge, sir. Don't probably judge. likes Phantom judge. Menace. Don't don't go judge, on. sir. Please. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you do like Phantom Menace, you can leave. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> go on. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go the Temple of Doom. Yes. Okay. Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. Number two. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. No, no. That's so wrong. Aliens is number two. Okay. With aliens more than alien. Oh, yeah. I could see that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I could absolutely see that. This is a generational thing. It, it is. Clearly. It is. No, absolutely. And it's so young. Whiplash. Oh, I love nice. Whiplash. Yeah. Nice. Of course, Whiplash. And then, frankly, any movie with Elijah Wood. Okay. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank Keep you, my friend. In. Keep that part in. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, brother. Matt was great. I loved having him on the show. And, and again, it gave me it gave me personal insight on what the uh, television market is looking for uh, as far as writers are concerned and pilots and, and shows. So I hope you guys learned a lot uh, and picked up a few knowledge bombs that was dropped by Matthew. Uh, thanks again, Matthew, for being on the show. We really, really appreciate it. And if you want the show notes and contact information for Matthew, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS016 for the show notes. And if you guys haven't already done so, please head over to ScreenwritingPodcast.com and leave us a good review, a five-star review if possible on iTunes. It really helps us out a lot and really helps us with the rankings. We're a new show, so every single review counts and helps. So thank you so, so much. And as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y.com. 